The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. Hello, Viewpoint listeners. This is BaseNet Internet Television National Political Correspondent Tony Mizuko coming to you with Episode 7 of Viewpoint. And I'm joined again this evening with our producer and the director of programming for BaseNet, Mr. Ed Jupin. Hello, Ed, Tony. How you been? Hey, no complaints here. Uh, the the election is getting very interesting. I'll uh, show. We've got quite a lot to discuss relating to the uh, election. But before we get into that, I want to announce the official first viewpoint de-endorsement. Now, I want a, to explain... A de-endorsement? Who did we endorse? A de- well, see, that's the thing. That's what's great about a BaseNet de-endorsement. You don't have to get... <laughs> we don't play by the rules. <laughs> no, we don't at all. You don't have to be endorsed to then lose an endorsement. I can just de-endorse you, which means you're somebody out there that you deserve to be de-endorsed even though you've never even been endorsed. Oh, the I first can't. official ever de-endorsement for, uh, for Viewpoint is Michelle Bachman. And I'm going to tell you why. Tuesday night, watching my Tuesday night shows, Sean Hannity, Bill O'Reilly, Greta Van Susteren comes on. Big announcement coming from Michelle Bachman. you got to stay tuned for a big announcement. And I said, oh, maybe she's making an endorsement. That would be interesting. I can't mm-hmm. wait to go and talk about that with our Viewpoint listeners. So time goes on. I sit through one or two stupid segments of Greta's show, which I've never really liked. And then finally Michelle Bachman gets on. And her big announcement that they kept plugging all along is that because of the redistricting in her rate, in her, uh, her home state, She's now still running in the same congressional district, but doesn't live in that district, which is technically legal, and she's doing that. So I that was was the big announcement. That was the big announcement. I waited to find out. Why did you? Why did she have to come on a worldwide cable station to make a local announcement like that? My guess is she's hoping to get money from someone somewhere, but she's not going to get anything from me. Actually, I'm going to send her a friggin' check that's going to bounce just so she gets charged the bounce check fee. So I can't believe she wasted my time. Her time in the national spotlight is gone. She did okay towards the end of her time in the campaign. She couldn't pull it off. Get back into your hole. Come back in 10 or 20 years. I'm so angry that you wasted my time, Michelle Bachman. You are officially de-endorsed by Viewpoint. You will never again be mentioned except in a negative content uh, context. Official de-endorsement of Michelle Bachman. Okay. So uh, who who are you going to endorse, or what do you have on the show lineup today? On the show lineup today, we're first going to talk about whether or not there's a media bias against Ron Paul, and I got a little bit of a funny story for that. Then we're going to update everyone on the spending in the race and where this money is going and how these candidates are raising and spending money. And then we're going to talk mostly about Michigan, but a little bit about Arizona and what's going to happen in the race there. And uh, the future of this overall... uh, Republican primary will probably be decided within about two weeks, and I think it's going to go in a direction none of us could have foreseen six months ago. If and you go we, back and listen, we might have to start talking about Obama. It's uh, we're we're getting there. Believe me, I'm gearing up for it because we're almost there. And if you want to go back and listen to our first couple episodes of Viewpoint, what I've done is once we know who the nominee is, I'm just going to go back and edit them to say I predicted it all along. So <laughs> no need to uh, no need to go back and listen to them because I'm just going to edit them to say whoever the nominee was right or wrong or uh, right along all along sorry so you know last year or last election cycle Ron Paul I don't want to say he burst onto the national stage but you first started having the Ron Paul revolution and, and his supporters started coming out and I didn't pay too much attention to it I didn't really look into it I think I started reading you know the revolution by Ron Paul or the Ron Paul whatever his, his main book there didn't really get into it too much you know agreed with a lot of it but was so focused on you know McCain over Obama and Hillary and all that. And then little by little, this election cycle, as it started, again, I didn't pay much attention to Ron Paul. And as time has gone on, I've, I've paid more attention. I've read into it. I've become a big fan of Ron Paul. You know, early on in some earlier episodes, I said there was some media bias. He did win a straw poll in California several months ago that was not reported by anyone in the media. Uh, it was a little blurb off to the side. But it's interesting. I was reading today, uh, or actually somebody posted an article on Facebook from the Daily Beast, which, you know, is pushing towards a de-endorsement themselves. But I don't want to water down the de-endorsements. <laughs> but the article, and I have it here, the, the headline says, experts say Iran attack is irrational, yet hawks are winning debate. And then the next couple lines, it says, from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to the head of Mossad, the experts are speaking out against attacking Iran over its nuclear program. But hawks like the GOP presidential candidates are drowning out the warnings. 
And then it goes on as a typical article saying, you know, we shouldn't attack Iraq, and here's all these people. And it names Rick Santorum, who's been a very big hawk on Iran, not saying he hasn't. Nowhere in this article does it mention Ron Paul and his support, uh, or his not support, I guess. I Non-support, want to do it, right. Uh, of attacking Iran. And I read through the whole thing, and I said, you know, if you're trying to write a balanced article, and you're trying to objectively yeah, look you, at it. Yeah, you do have one of the four remaining candidates who's totally against it. Who, who raised as much money as Rick right. Santorum in January. He's one of four Republican candidates. He's a national figure no matter what. Yep. And you don't mention at all, I mean, not even a single line of, oh, yep, yep, by the way. Well, there's nothing new about this. It's been going on through this whole campaign. You know, it it frustrates me. And I'm more angry with Republicans than anyone else because they won't stand up and say that this is really happening. This really is a bias against Ron Paul. And I'm going to tell you what it is. It's two things. It's 70% one thing and it's 30% the other thing. 30% of it is fear. Because people on the right and the left are probably afraid that Ron Paul is right about a lot of things, that you can't really argue against a lot of the things that he says, and they're afraid that people might actually get along with a third-party candidate, that they might actually break the hold the two parties have on this country. That's about what 30% of this bias is. Do you want to know what the other 70% of this bias is? It's called stupidity. Most people are just too stupid to understand what he's actually talking about. And I'll admit, it gets a little complicated when he starts talking about fiat money and this and that and the other thing. But people don't want to understand a gold standard. They don't want to understand what a currency is, how it actually works, how the Federal Reserve works. I mean, nobody knows what the Federal Reserve actually really, really does. I mean, I've taken, I can't tell you how many college classes, and I don't even think the Federal Reserve ever came up. I think it might have come up in, uh, you know, one of Hagrid's Care of Magical Creatures classes, but that's about it. I mean, there's nothing there about it in a lot of college curriculum. So anyway, I think that these people in the media and a lot of people out there in the in the world just don't understand it, and they're just too stupid to understand it. I'm going to tell you another funny story. A, a friend of mine, somebody who's very, very liberal, always posting articles about how, you know, people on the right are evil and, you know, all that jazz, posted this article. And he's just somebody who lives in Washington, is very politically involved and, you know, has had a lot of works for some congressmen and works for some big media outlets down there. And he'll usually get a lot of debates and discussions going on his Facebook page. And I generally don't tend to get into that because, you know, I don't think Facebook's an appropriate medium medium to have an intellectual discussion like we do here on Viewpoint. But anyway, he posts this article and somebody says something and he replies and, you know, a friend of his replies back, you know, oh, well, Joe, and then I replied, I got into the conversation. I said, you know, I'm not one of those diehard Paul supporters, but this article makes no mention Mm -hmm. of Paul and his opposition to it. Now, about an hour later, somebody else commented on it and said something about, you know, oh, both parties, this, that, the other thing, war is bad. And then there was nothing else in it. No response. No one else said anything. I mean, wow. it's not a media bias against Ron Paul. It's also there's a social media bias. Sure. I mean, people didn't even want to continue the discussion because what are they going to say? Gee, you're absolutely right. Ron Paul wasn't mentioned. This is now a crappy article that I posted to try to make people on the right look crazy. And Rick and Ron views on Iran are a little crazy. Nothing wrong with saying that. But I, I didn't even get a response on Facebook. And speaking of crazy, maybe people have looked at uh, Ron Paul back from the beginning as just being this crazy third party type candidate and just never took him seriously, never would take him seriously. Right. And, you know, that might be it. But I'll tell you what, if we end up regardless, I, I'm, I'm thinking we're moving towards uh, some sort of a conflict with Iran. And I think it's probably going to happen regardless of whoever the Republican nominee is, unless it was Ron Paul, or whether or not Obama does. But I want to make it make a statement right here, right now. If we end up in war, in some sort of a conflict with Iran, I'm going to come back and say, if you had gone with Ron Paul, mm-hmm. we wouldn't be in this conflict. It's just, it's bad for democracy that we're not giving these people an honest chance to view, you know, to share their views and to focus on them. And listen... Ron Paul's not doing the best in the race, but he's still hanging in there between 10 or 15 or 20 percent, depending on where you look at it. Certainly consistent. Certainly consistent. Came in second in Maine. His support has never dropped, like how other people have had their support drop considerably. He raised as much money as Rick Santorum. And you know what? In January, we're going to get into this in a minute, he raised $4.5 million, and Romney raised $6.5 million. So, I mean, when you look at it that way, he's got a, you know, we always talk about his dedicated supporters, but 
you know, he's not he's a spending fringe, a hell of a lot less. Yeah, exactly. He's not a fringe candidate. He's not at one percent. He's not at half a percent. He's not some whack job. He's been a congressman for twenty years in a, in, in his district, or you know, split up between two different uh, terms running. He's consistently getting ten or more percent of the Republican vote in a race where nobody's winning by fifty, sixty, seventy percent. So I mean. He's really being ignored. I, there really is a media bias, and I think it's terrible. And it's worse for people on the right who don't want to support a Republican, a true conservative, and they just, you know, they want to claim there's a media bias when their guy's out there running against Obama. But there's a media bias right now against Ron Paul, and they're not saying anything about it. So the establishment Republicans out there, if you lose this race, it's your fault, and I hope you do lose this race. You might as well go become Democrats or something else because, you know what, you're losing it because you refuse to stand on your principles. You only care about the bias argument when it's in your favor. When it's Ron Paul, you seem to want to ignore it. So if you're any of you out there, Ron Paul supporters, let me know. Let me know if you think I'm right or wrong. I'm sure I know what your answer is going to be. If you're not a Ron Paul, Ron Paul supporter, if you're an Obama supporter, email us at, and let us know if you think I'm wrong. Because I certainly see a bias. And this is coming from somebody from four years ago, paid no attention to Ron Paul at the start of this election cycle, paid little or no attention to him. I'm still not a Ron Paul-ite, but I'm now going to vote in the primary on Super Tuesday for Ron Paul just because of the way he's getting treated. And I hope a lot of other people join me you know, along in doing that. But that's the, the Ron Paul media and social media bias since you know the media doesn't want to talk about him and then ordinary people don't seem to want to talk about him. But we're going to talk about him here sure on we point. Because, yeah, that's what we like to do. But we're going to move on and talk about an update on the ever-going, uh, you know, ever-changing Republican primary and we're going to talk a little bit about the fundraising that's been going on in January. The candidates released their numbers. Now, the PACs, the super PACs, raised all sorts of money, which is technically separate from the candidates. But we know that's all really not true. But the candidates themselves, it's an interesting uh, dynamic. Romney came in with about $6.5 million. Um, I believe Gingrich was actually second with $5.5 million. And then Santorum and Paul were tied with $4.5 million each. Now, Gingrich's PAC, Super PAC, raised a huge amount of money. But again, it's coming from the guy that owns the same The one Vegas, big don donator, right? Right, who said something like he might give $100 million to either Gingrich or one of the other candidates, you know, to counteract some of the George Soros types out there and George Soros himself. So it's very interesting that although these candidates are somewhat all over the place, their fundraising is pretty steady. But I want to bring something up. Somebody on Fox News recently had said that the... RNC had raised a very similar amount of cash, if not a little bit more than the DNC, which people should start to get worried that Obama's not going to have the machine he, uh, you know, he thinks he is. His fundraising was much higher, almost double than the Republicans, but you still have four candidates spread out among a very wide range of, of the party still raising over $20, 25000000 million. And this is at a point where people are afraid to put their money in. People don't like to put their money into a race until they know a candidate's the nominee, until they know there's a chance of the candidate winning. So if we had had one person running in the race right now, you're looking at probably a minimum of $20, 25000000 million. I don't know if it's as important for Obama being the uh, sitting president, being the incumbent. You know, it, it, I don't think it, – it's funny. Money has played – for years, everyone's always complained that money has played such a role in elections and such a low role in races. And I think now what you're seeing with the economy being down, there's a real issue out there where it might play less of a role. And it might be that because money – and this is an interesting concept here – because money has taken such a hold of political races and because there's so much of it, it no longer has the kind of impact it once did. You give a candidate a million dollars, well, if you want to run an ad at, you know, 7.30 at night on a major news network, maybe that'll buy it four seconds. You know, so, I mean, the, the millions and millions and tens of millions of dollars, it just doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, and getting, it, getting into your money uh, concept here, they're saying that the way Romney is spending his money over the past month or so, in another six weeks, his campaign's going to be well, broke. Well, here's the thing. Romney spent over 30 – now, I want everyone to take a, take a pause here and get ready to listen to this. Turn your volume up. $30 million in January. Just stop and picture all those zeros in your mind. Picture how much money that is. How many people would be set for life on $30 million? And here we are talking about how Mitt Romney might not win this nomination, let alone an election. And I think that's where you're seeing – and part of it's about the primaries where you have to run in so many states but not in so many other states. But it's almost that money is might somewhat become irrelevant because there's just – there's so much to spend. There's so much to do. You just can't do it all. And I think as media itself changes, as people you know, more and more are on the web and that's where more and more people are getting their news and getting their information, 
and you know the news cycle is getting shorter and shorter in a sense that so you know we need news every 15 minutes to keep uh, keep our short attention spans money in, is almost might become less relevant it might become a necessity where you know you can't run it without this but what used to be the determination at least at a national level between a well funded campaign and a not so well funded campaign i don't think it's going to be out there because i think the media themselves the media being the whore that it is needs two candidates to make a race interesting and you're almost going to get all that free publicity because you're going to be the guy that's not the current incumbent. Now, I'm, that's not to say if you're running a small local race for a state representative, uh, you know, a state senator somewhere, and, you know, I've got 300 grand in the bank and you've got four grand in the bank. No, that makes a real difference as to whether or not you can get signs out there, whether you can buy coffee for your people holding your signs, all those little things. But it's just you're playing at such a big level. There's so much money that it's almost irrelevant. And I often say this about that's the problem with Congress and, and people in general when they look at things like the debt and the deficit in this country is you're talking about such massive numbers that it stops becoming real. I mean, if you think of Obama is going to raise a billion dollars for this campaign, which is what they're saying, I mean, at that point, the marginal return beyond a certain point is just nil. Mm -hmm. It really is. I mean, you can get your mess. I mean, look at Ron Paul, again, always running a lean campaign and does very well with fundraising. You look at Rick Santorum, who hasn't raised much money, but he's now winning all these, you know, caucuses, caucus I. So I, I you know, I just don't know where the funding's going to go. I think Gingrich's backer, who has given him an enormous amount of money, I don't think he's going to necessarily infuse another huge amount into Gingrich because if he's remotely intelligent, he's going to see the writing on the wall that giving Gingrich five or ten million may not make any difference at all. Now, if Gingrich was still locked in a neck and neck battle with Romney. Sure, he'd probably want to give him that money and see where it goes, but I can't see you know a ten or twenty or thirty million making dollars making a difference now. Making a difference for Gingrich. I mean, he can I, look at Romney again, thirty plus million dollars. That's still a lot of money, even in our inflated economy today, and, and it's almost got him nothing. It lost him races in January. I mean, if thirty million dollars loses mm -hmm. you a race, what in God's name do you want? You know, what does it take to win a race? A billion dollars, maybe they're saying. So I think that uh, because Romney spent so much money, his PAC spent so much money, he has got his back to the wall. And, and you'll give him credit for being a smart candidate in the sense that he's unloading everything. He's probably told his people, like a good executive, this is it. We've got to win it for Super Tuesday. We're going to spend it all. We're going to do everything because if we do and we win, we'll be the nominee. We'll get the money back. If not, we're finished anyway. If you lose, you can't do anything with the money anyway. Exactly. Right. And a rich guy like Romney's not going to care about that uh, right. in and of itself, which might be why he also was okay with spending all the PAC money and spending all the uh, the campaign money. Because, you know, whereas other people might be worried about some debts left over from the campaign or, you know, mm -hmm. as they're running around thanking supporters, they want to, you know, fly at the expense of the campaign first class and stay in a five-star hotel to go thank some donor. He doesn't need to worry get. about that. Yeah, Romney doesn't care about that. So, I mean, he's doing what he has to do to win it. He's going to spend his money and he's going to call it a day. It'd be interesting to see if this this uh, Sands guy, the guy that owns the Sands that's been backing uh, Gingrich, if he does end up giving, you know, 50 or $100 million to a PAC that backs the eventual nominee. Because at that point, you might see a little bit of a difference in the money. But even then, I'm, I, unless Obama raises a billion dollars and the Republicans raise, you know, 70 million, well, yeah, that's a huge enough difference that it's going to make uh, – have an impact. But I don't really think that that's going to have uh, too big of a race. But it'll be interesting to see if you finally start having that. I still don't know that that would buy votes anyway, ultimately. Oh, no, I don't think it is. I mean, a campaign like Santorum that might be a little, you know, a little low on cash to get that sort of organization out there, to get the, you know, the down payments to rent the office space in different areas. Yeah, but you got to remember, the party raises money, and whoever the eventual nominee is gets flooded with, uh, with money. There was a controversy four years ago when Sarah Palin and the Republican Party bought her a couple hundred grand worth of clothes mm -hmm. for the convention and, and, and you know it's that's how these things happen i mean you're on a world stage you need you know world-class dress whatever the heck that is that's what it costs sure could it buy ordinary guys like you and i a house and a car and all this other great stuff but it, it is what it is so that money is going to come from somewhere and i think the republican the rnc fundraising in january showed that you know people are willing to give but you know nobody wants to give to the losing candidate and i'm saying that coming as somebody who's given Herman Cain quite a few dollars <laughs> in my day but you know you never want to give that money to the uh and i give it to ron paul too and rick Santorum. i i tend to give a lot of my i, I give a i'd like to say i give a little in abundance or you know they say a little the jimmy fund always says a little in an abundance is a lot well a little in a little is still a little but that's all i can do uh, yeah i mean money i think it's interesting maybe this will be the race in history at least the presidential race 
where money almost stopped mattering and just sort of became a thing. You know, yeah, you got to have the money just like you got to be a citizen. Oh, wait, you don't. Sorry. Anyway, um, moving on. But <laughs> Oh, OK. The, um, yeah. So the race, the, the, the money being spent is outrageous and the money being raised is outrageous. But, uh, you know, we'll have to see what happens. Ron Paul still has the best fundraising uh, numbers. If you look at him in terms of the number of donors and how much they're giving and when he puts out a request and the response that it gets. But we're going to move on and talk a brief, brief bit about Michigan, Arizona, and what's going to happen there and what's going to happen Super Tuesday. Now, I took a look at some polling, and I tend to like the Real Clear Politics polls because they'll give you a lot of different polls, and they'll give you the RCP average, which is a great way to look at some of the polls. you got to be careful because sometimes they'll be averaging a few polls that have some outliers that are some, you know, some weird numbers there, or they'll, you know, pick some random tuscahooga community college poll with, not you that know. there's anything wrong with tuscahooga college exactly if it's even real i might be making <laughs> it up but uh you know they'll pick some random poll that'll have you know some guy that's not even in the race up 30 points i mean other than that but though the rcp average ends up being a pretty good average or a pretty good indicator now interestingly enough out of six of their on the average i should say rick santorum is up three points in michigan out of six polls they had Santorum was winning five of them. Actually, out of seven polls they had, Santorum was winning five, and I think that includes the uh, average. Romney was winning in one, and Romney and Santorum were tying in one. Now, that's some interesting figures. In none of these numbers, I mean, Santorum's up a couple percentage, and I think Michigan splits its delegates based on who wins, and Romney does still have a lead in delegates. But in a sense, that doesn't matter because it's the media coverage from having won a primary that really matters in some ways more than the delegates. But it shows that Romney is very weak, if not the loser, in Michigan. And everyone had sort of said that New Hampshire was Romney's firewall. And if Romney doesn't win New Hampshire, he's done. That's what he needs to win to go forward and win the nomination. Well, it seems like that firewall has been pushed back quite a bit to, to Michigan. He beat Romney beat John McCain in Michigan four years ago handily handily swamped him in Michigan. It was Romney's, and it is Romney's home state. It's where he's originally from. His governor was a former, uh, his governor was a former father of Michigan, yeah. <laughs> his father was a former governor of Michigan, uh, former uh, car executive. I think that you know, Romney should do well there if you look at it on paper, but in reality, he's not. I mean, if the man can't win Michigan, uh, I think it's done. Now, it's possible that he could come out with a win, but here's why Rick Santorum's really, really resonating in Michigan. One is I think you've got a lot. You do have some social conservatives. It is the, it is the Midwest. Uh, you know, again, and I've given the description to everybody that, you know, being from the Boston area, the Midwest starts in New York. Uh, anything west of the city, I consider the Midwest. But, you know, he's from Pennsylvania. So for us on the East Coast, that's the Midwest. He, you know, Heartland Rick, I think, appeals to a lot of these people. He appeals to a lot of Catholics. Because he's Catholic. And I think especially this controversy over, you know, Obama and the birth control and then the churches and all this big giant mess. I think that's really turning people to Santorum because he's taking a strong stance on it. And a lot of Catholics are going to look for him to, on issues like that. And Catholics in Michigan go for Republicans over Democrats like three to one. And there are a lot of blue collar Democrats, a lot of the, the blue dog Democrats, whatever you want to call them, the Reagan Democrats. I mean – you know, we come up with all these terms for these Democrats who end up voting for Republicans. I think the proper term is just smart Democrats. They're really going to like, they really do like Rick Santorum, and he, he's resonating with them. And it's not just in Michigan. There was an article recently that people in a small town in Ohio really like that he wants to bring back manufacturing. They said, you know, here he is stopping in a small camp, a small town and taking the time to talk to us. And the way he speaks to people, how he talks, it resonates with people, and they're liking it. And I think that's going to happen in Michigan. And I think it is happening. Now, I've, ne I've said this all along. Mitt Romney is by no means bad guy. I think he's, out of all the candidates, he's probably actually the nicest one of them. He's probably genuinely the best person out of all of them. I mean, he's a really good guy. His success is his own. He's made all of his own money. But no matter how nice he is, no matter how great of a guy he is, he's just so well-raised and so well-bred and so wealthy. People that, can't know, relate to him. Exactly. It's very, very tough. And it's not like he's a snob. He's not like the Kennedys or anything. But you know what I mean? I, if I was standing on a yacht with, uh, you know, Mitt Romney, which I don't think I've ever been on a yacht, I'd be wondering, you know, how much money did this guy's shirt cost? Did he spend $480 on his shirt? That's what I spent on my entire outfit. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what I mean? Like, look at his watch. You know, this is a man who could buy a $50,000 watch. And not that there's wrong with that. We don't want to approach this, uh, you know, a third world mentality in America where we, we, you know, don't want people to be successful and we, we look down on people who are successful. 
But, you know, when you have that much money, it is hard to, the way you interact with people uh, comes a little different. I, uh, and this is going to sound terrible, but I was watching Titanic again recently, which is a phenomenal movie. I don't agree with the fact that they're re-releasing it in 3D. Mitt Romney would be the, the Hartley character there. I mean, not, not being a jerk, but he, I mean, he'd be eating with the first class passengers and he's a great guy, but, you know, he doesn't know how to go down on the lower decks and have the party there. And anyone who's seen the movie knows what I'm talking about. And I think that's why when Mitt Romney speaks to a crowd of, of you know ordinary people, there is a little bit of a tough reason to disconnect because, yeah, he's passionate. Yeah, he cares. Yeah, he's smart. But he just oozes, I'm a rich, successful businessman, and in a good way. But I, I think that's where Heartland Rick is coming through these small towns and being like, yeah, you should have a good job and you should be manufacturing. And the other thing, and people have always said this about Romney, Romney, I think, is he's, he's too well-bred. He doesn't get angry and yell and stuff. And, and Rick Santorum gets a little angry, and people have wanted that. Mm -hmm. I think that's what people first liked about, you know, Herman Cain, for instance, and then liked about Newt Gingrich is they want somebody who, you know, is going to get a little loud on the stage, who's going to get a little angry. And uh, Mitt Romney is just too well composed. He's too super professional. And this, those aren't bad things. Don't get me wrong. They're not bad things by any means. Mitt Romney is very presidential. But people like the fact that Rick Santorum is losing his voice a little bit because he's getting angry. And he's, you know, you can see it in his gestures and he's gesturing with his hand. I mean, he's almost got a little Mussolini in him there, you know. <laughs> but I mean, he, he's getting angry. He's getting passion. And people can feel the passion. And you look at Mitt Romney and I think it's like, I, I keep doing this on Viewpoint. I keep destroying, you know, my idols here. And I did it with Gingrich a few weeks ago. People I, I really do enjoy and idolize in a lot, of, at least politically. But, you know, you look at Mitt Romney and you're like, yeah, this guy would be, you know, great to do my tax. If I had a company, I'd want him to be the CFO or, you know, he could be the president of the company. But, you know, you look at Rick and it's like, this is a guy I can get behind. I can support him. He's he's there. He's with me. And I think that's where that's really, really going to resonate in Michigan because it's resonated in Pennsylvania. And we've said this before. Santorum's won big and he's lost big in a blue state. But I think he has that capture those people, you know, capture that sort of blue collar element. And here's. We, you know, we come down to the Republican vote in, in Michigan. That's who those people. That's who a lot of those people are. They're gonna want to vote for a Rick Santorum type candidate. Now, if he wins Michigan, I think Romney's campaign is just about done. Arizona could pull Romney back, but here's the thing: they're polling close to even Romney up a couple points in Arizona. And unfortunately, if Santorum sweeps both of them, Romney is mo. I would say he's 80 percent done, and I'll explain that in a minute. If they when, if Santorum wins one and Romney wins one, it goes to, you know, Super Tuesday, and that'll be the determinant. Now, I said... Well, if Michigan isn't a winner-take-all. They split the uh, delegates. Uh, Arizona is a winner-take-all. So that'll right. that'll make a difference Romney there, just big, on how they split the delegates. Romney will have a big lead in delegates, if that's the case. But I think it's the, it's the media coverage of being the winner. Now, they didn't really do it to Santorum on Trifecta Tuesday... But I think it's people say, oh, you know, Centaurum won, Centaurum won. And then you start talking about delegates and everyone, you know, their eyes glaze over. And it's like, oh, rules and regulations and the real world and stuff that we have to read and think about. And they lose focus. So, uh, you know, while Romney could even come out in theory in delegates, I think a Centaurum win is going to really propel him. Now, I said Romney was 80 percent done if Centaurum won both. Super Tuesday is going to roll around. And best case, best case scenario is either Romney comes back and sweeps Super Tuesday. Or Santorum sweeps Super Tuesday. Worst case scenario is Super Tuesday gets pretty much split four ways and no one emerges. I don't think it's going to be an even split. I've always said that Paul is carrying it all the way to the end. I know that I've been told that Gingrich is now, they're projecting he may not even be able to win his home state of Georgia. If Gingrich loses Georgia in Super Tuesday, he's going to bow out. Because I'm telling you, his money is drying up and it's going to dry up completely on uh, Super Tuesday. You know what I'm keeping an eye on for Super Tuesday between Santorum and Romney? What's that? Ironically enough, and it's not because I live here, the state of Massachusetts, if Santorum beats Romney, there's your whole Super Tuesday and there's your whole campaign. That's true. And you know, there's... I don't think Romney could... There's no way Romney could get the nomination. So let's assume Santorum wins Michigan, Romney's home home state. Now, if Santorum beats Romney in Massachusetts, no one beats Romney. <laughs> then, then I think it's all over. I, I think you're absolutely right. Now, everyone's going to say, "How could Mitt Romney lose in the state he was governor in?" And you know, a fairly successful governor, if I may say. And I'll explain it to everyone. Massachusetts has what's called a horrible open primary. The word "horrible" is not really in there, but I'm going to add it in there. That is to say that you can vote in either primary now. 
no one is going to be caring about voting in the Democratic primary in Massachusetts because A, Obama is going to win Massachusetts anyway, and B, he's not running against anyone. But four years ago, I actually knew Democrats who intentionally went in and voted as a Republican and voted for McCain because they didn't like Romney. So if a Democrat is on the ballot, or excuse me, if a Democrat approaches the ballot in Massachusetts and they decide they want to vote in the Republican nominee, the Republican contest, then Massachusetts isn't the only state with an open primary like this. Whereas Romney had support among Republicans in Massachusetts, obviously the Democrats didn't like him, even though it's a majority Democrat state. The Democrats would be more likely to vote for somebody else that's not Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. Now, are they going to be voting for Santorum because they like him? No. I actually think if they're intelligent, they would vote for Gingrich because that will throw the biggest wrench into the puzzle. It'll be sort of like Rush Limbaugh's Operation Chaos a few years ago uh, in the last election cycle. Because Gingrich doing well would kind of make everyone, you know, would make it more complicated. But, you know, among Republicans, they might say, hey, we want Santorum too. Republicans in Massachusetts are an interesting breed. But that's the other thing. Because you have Republicans who, if they're split the way they were, you know, the, the way they are nationally, and you have Democrats who are not going to want to vote for Romney, but are going to choose to vote in the Republican primary, specifically not to vote for Romney, or just because they want to vote in the Republican primary, they might not pick Romney. Um, although some of them could say that maybe they could stomach Romney and they want him. But I, I mean, when your second home state is not a shoe in you really do got to question what's going to happen. And Massachusetts is not wrapped up. It's not like Romney's going to win 80 percent of the vote in his home state. And you're right. People are going to say, geez, he didn't win Michigan where he's from, where he won handily a few years ago. His father was a former governor in Michigan. And then you roll around to Massachusetts and He's not winning the state he was governor in, the state he, he lived in. I don't know. He's got a bunch of houses, so he probably lives in several places. I think he lives in Belmont, Massachusetts. Well, I, I believe in, in Michigan, I believe he was born there. And then, of course, his father was governor there. Uh, Massachusetts, yeah, he owned a house or two here. Uh, but his big claim to fame was being governor. Right, a absolutely. And I'm sure he probably went to Harvard and, you know, I think was Bain Capital based in Boston? I think it might have been. Um, I think I think he spent his his more of his adult years here, but you know it, it's Mitt Romney. I, I mean, he could lose his own state handily. So, but anyway, it, going back to what I said earlier, you come into Super Tuesday. Could Romney hypothetically win a majority of these contests? Yes, and then it'll get stretched out, but it'll be pretty clear that he's the nominee. Could Santorum come in and win a handful? But not of really. Them? All of the projections I've seen. If, if you stretch this uh, primary season out with whether it's one, two, or, you know, two, three, or four top-tier candidates now, none of them hit that magic number of 1125 or whatever it is. That's true. And so they're still talking about the brokered convention. And just this week, who pops into the conversation? Sarah Palin again. And what does Sarah Palin say? She says she is not looking to uh, become president, but... At a brokered convention, anything could go. Yeah, I don't think anyone would pick Sarah Palin at a brokered convention. Uh, I don't put anything past anybody the way this primary season's going. Oh, you know that's that's true. That's a good point. But what I was saying, is you know, if if they're not if they're not happy, and I I mean this really non-jokingly, if they're not happy with these top four candidates that we have now, if none of them could win the majority of delegates before the convention, and it is a brokered convention. In my opinion, as I see it, oh, wrong show, it's going to come down to Sarah Palin or Chris Christie, and Chris Christie will not take it. Sarah Palin won't say no. You know, that's a very, I, I'll agree with you 100% on that, but Chris Christie might be willing to take it. I don't if think there's, so. If there's some backroom deal where they say, you know, Chris, do it, you'll be the nominee, maybe. But the other thing is, I don't necessarily think that they're going to pick somebody other than these four at the convention, because here's the thing. Mm -hmm. After Super Tuesday, let's say Gingrich runs out of money and dries up, although you still need to contend with that at the convention, he might turn around and say, I support Rick Santorum, I want all my yeah. delegates to go to him, I support him, and then it could come down between Romney and Santorum. But the other thing is, you know, if Santorum were to lose big on Super Tuesday, his campaign too would be over, he doesn't have many delegates, and he might turn around and say, well, you know, whatever, Romney take them, and Gingrich says Romney take them. And then Romney wins. So just because somebody has the delegates after Super Tuesday, they might lose. Uh, they might still turn, you know, they might still turn around and their campaigning, you know, give their delegates to somebody else. That's why I think if, if Romney wins big on Super Tuesday, somebody's going to lose. Uh, somebody's going to drop out and probably you know, it'll probably be Gingrich and shift their support to him. I think we're going to lose somebody after Super Tuesday, and I think it's going to be Gingrich because it's not going to be Santorum unless for some reason he drops way, no. way down. No. 
I mean, if Santorum, you know, if you look at the all 18 contests or however they are on Super Tuesday, if he wins the equivalent of, you know, only 20% or something like that, he's done. Same thing with Romney. If for whatever reason Romney gets trumped and he doesn't win anything and he's way, way down there, his campaign will be over after Super Tuesday, too. I still and think the, if he just loses Massachusetts on Super Tuesday, it's over. That might be it as well. But now what's Romney going to do with his delegates is the question. He, I think, will endorse somebody, and I don't think he would endorse Ron Paul, unfortunately. I don't think he's going to go with Gingrich because Gingrich no, is the it, one who really started the personal attacks on Romney. So I honestly think that, you know... It would be Santorum. It would be Santorum. Now, all of a sudden, if after Super Tuesday... It's Santorum with the Romney backing and, you know, against Gingrich and Paul. I mean, you're going to have a Gingrich-Santorum battle. I think Gingrich is going to be done anyway. So mm -hmm. I, I think that that's going to happen. And I think Santorum could endorse Romney if he loses big. Now, again, I've said that, you know, best case scenario, there are two of them. Either Romney or Santorum win handily. Your worst case scenario is these contents are pretty much split evenly four ways because then you don't have anyone that wants to give up or anyone that wants to drop out. Financial reasons might concern, you know, might make the need to do that. But again, Romney might be like, "Hey, I lost Massachusetts, but won nine other primaries, so screw it, I'm going to go with it." The way Vice I first. see it, nobody's going to hit this magic number, and it's going to come down to the convention. And then, if that's the case, you still see it as some backroom deals, then. Well, you know, I think there's going to be some backroom deals uh, short of somebody pledging their delegates to somebody. Because again, you go into a convention, just Romney and Paul, let's say, are left in the race. But Gingrich and Santorum have pledged their delegates to Romney. He technically doesn't have the amount, but when it comes to that nomination on the floor, Paul's going to make a stink, but Romney's going to get the nomination. He's going to be crowned, you know, nominee. Unless, the, unless Super Tuesday gets split four ways, if we have a real split where it's, it's you know, 30 to Romney, mm -hmm. 28 to Santorum, 24 to Gingrich, and, you know, 18 to Paul, and I don't know, that might add up to more than 100 for all I know. That's when you could see a problem because yeah, that's those, no those are point. scenarios I've seen. In scenarios like that, the closest anybody comes to the magic number is like nine hundred something. Still right, so about two hundred shy. Right now, you, I don't necessarily think. I think Santorum is young enough, and I think he'd probably be willing to accept being vice president. Romney wouldn't. I don't no. think Gingrich would, and Paul certainly isn't going to. No. But I could see a Romney Santorum deal, and I think a Romney Santorum ticket would actually be pretty strong. Because you're going to get the establishment behind it, you're going to get some of the social conservatives behind it, and you're going to kind of be able to pull both ends of the party together. Ron Paul will still be a thorn in their side, but you'll be able to pull different ends of the party together. And I think it would be Romney on top and Santorum on the bottom of the ticket. Yeah, it wouldn't go the other way. Romney wouldn't take that. Yeah, because I don't think Romney would want to be vice president. No. I think Santorum could pick somebody you know, better than Romney yeah. to help his yeah. ticket. Um, a lot more, but I could definitely see a Romney on top. Now, what might happen is Romney has 700 delegates and Santorum has 500 delegates mm -hmm. and it's, well, Santorum's only going to give him up for, for uh, Green and to make him the, the vice yeah. president. And again, that, no, could that kind of deal could certainly happen. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't think we're necessarily going to get to the convention where literally there's a room at the convention where people are begging Chris Christie to come out and say, just pick mm -hmm. me, screw the rest of these guys, unless Super Tuesday's a wash. Right. Because if Super Tuesday is some god awful, you know, nobody wins it and everyone kind of comes out of you, then it could be a nightmare. But I think you might see a Romney or Santorum pull ahead enough in these races to win enough of them that they're then, you know, that they're then the kingmaker, so to speak. You know, but I'm already looking forward to 2016 because 2016, <laughs> you you know, Chris Christie's going to be there. Sarah Palin might be there. Unless because Obama, unless Obama loses. You know Jeb Bush is going to be there. Oh, yeah. No, it's definitely going to be. 2016 would be really interesting. I, you know, I think it'll be a really good race, but, uh, you know, Obama might lose. Mm -hmm. I've always said this, you know, it, it, like Bill Clinton said many years ago, it's the economy stupid. And, you know, numbers, Gallup actually released their unemployment numbers. And they tend to generally go where I think it is the CBO goes with their uh, numbers. And they said unemployment, you know, is back up mm -hmm. uh, for February. So. The problem then becomes if the economy is still as many people as it honestly is. I mean, the, the participation rate is down and all that in the workforce. But with a bad economy, it's not going to be difficult for Obama to win. I mean, it's not going to be easy for Obama to win. Sorry. Right. right. So, you know, we may not have a Republican nominee in 2016 because it might be the mm -hmm. Republican president. Because it might be the Republican president, yeah. Right. And I think if the economy was very good right now, if there was real serious change in unemployment, 
yeah, it'd be very tough to unseat Obama. But it, and it's always untough, to, always tough to unseat a president. And I've said that as sitting president. I've said that before, and I'll, I, that's the honest to God truth, and it always will be. But the economy's not doing very well. If unemployment is still hanging around, I mean, people have said unemployment is still above, you know, six or seven percent. There's no, you know, historically no one's ever gotten reelected, yada, yada, yada. But I mean, uh, unemployment's not doing very well. And you're starting to see, you know, the, the people are getting off, uh, getting off unemployment and, you know, applying for disability mm-hmm. and all these other things. So you're seeing these issues. The debt ceiling debate is likely to come up before the election again. And, you know, it could all come down to sort of inspire and collapse in on Obama because of the economy. It's going to be a big, big issue. Gas prices are, raise, uh, are, you know, going up like crazy everywhere. And these are shifts within a month or two of the election that could have a big deal. If gas drops to two ninety a gallon in October, Obama's probably going to get reelected. Not going to happen because, unfortunately, as you said, Iran's probably going to happen. You're, you're, and there, there goes your gas prices. You're absolutely right. If, you know, gas is four, you know, four bucks in a lot of places where it's usually cheap on November 4th or, or whenever uh, the next election is, Obama's not going to win. I think it's going to be a tough race. But the interesting thing is the Obama campaign is releasing attack ads in Michigan sort of targeting the top three each individually, which shows that they're worried. Yeah, because they're, shows that they're, they don't they're doing want... a lot against Santorum right now, though. They're, yep. they're really starting to target Santorum. Right, and it's because they don't know who the nominee is. And oh. that's a good thing for, for the Republicans, but it's good that we don't know who this nominee is. I've always said no matter how difficult this process is, no matter how bad it might be for one party, it's good for our democracy that we're really, really banging our heads over who to pick and figuring oh, out. Oh, and what... like we say, four years ago... Obama and uh, Hillary were still fighting it out in July and August. Hillary was still in the was still in the game as late as July or August four years ago. Right, absolutely. Oh. And the, the, it's funny, Michigan played a role in that one where yep. if the delegates in Michigan had been sad, it quite possibly could have been Hillary. So huh. I don't know. All eyes are on Michigan, I guess, uh, every huh. election. So goes Michigan, so goes the nation, maybe. Yeah. Um, or so goes Michigan, so goes the loser depending on how you want to look at it. But I, I think it's going to be an interesting um, an interesting Super Tuesday. There's, I believe, one debate left prior to Michigan and Arizona. I don't think the debates are going to have any big impact at this point. I think we've, we've sort of vetted the whole debate system, and, and, you know, it was good. I was glad they gave these candidates these this many opportunities to get up on the stage. Now, if the convention is, I believe it's the last week of August, is that correct? Yes. If come August 1st, you still have two or three people fighting out for the debate, you know, fighting out, and there, there's no grand bargain being struck. If you know people refuse to give up, yeah, I think the networks would be wise to throw a couple debates in there right before the uh, the convention. Sure. But um, it'll be interesting to see what causes what happens at the convention in the sense that uh, oh, and remind me to talk about the Democratic convention in a minute. But you know, the conventions have become coronations, and you know, nobody really watches the news coverage of what goes on during the day because you know at night there's these packed auditoriums with you know a hundred thousand people and people giving speeches and during the day it's a bunch of people reading off a roll and reading a platform and this and that but you might see something more interesting where you know during the day it's a lot more heated and there's a lot more media coverage wondering what people are actually doing but i want to talk briefly before we move on and before we uh, close out today's show about the democratic convention for 2012 several people and it, really more than several but a, a lot of people out there have been saying that you know the occupy movement and others are calling for massive protests at the 2012 Democratic Convention. Some people have said that they're trying to make it like the 1968 convention, which, you know, if everyone remembers or you've seen on TV was, you know, in very you right in Detroit. And, and, you know, there were, I don't want to say riots, but I mean, it, it was, you know, there was a lot of police action and a lot of you know, violence, I guess you would say. I mean, strong protesting. I don't want to call them rioters, but, you know, the rioting and the convention type rioting. I think, and you understand the the politics of it. They want to move the party to the left. They want to make sure that Obama hasn't abandoned his base, which he pretty much has, but whatever. But I don't think that's going to be a good thing for the Democrats. Because if you remember back to 1968, who ended up winning that election? Do you remember, Ed? Nixon. Absolutely, Richard Nixon, who, despite being a Republican, was actually very progressive. So I encourage you all to actually read your Richard Nixon history. Anywho... And I think that, you know, you had a Republican who won pretty well and won four years very handily. I think that could happen as well because people might see Occupy protesters. If there are a lot of, you know, rioting and looting and they're wearing their masks and all this, that's going to change the way the coverage of the convention is. And people are going to see that. And I don't think they're going to like it. I don't think a lot of the great silent majority, as Richard Nixon called it, 
are going to like watching that, just like they didn't like watching it over 40 years ago. I don't think middle-of-the-road Democrats, middle-of-the-road independents and Republicans are going to say, hey, look at these people, you know, wearing their communist sweatshirts, throwing bricks at cops. I don't think they're going to say, hey, this makes me want to pick a Democrat. Mm -hmm. uh, so while I would never want to give the political opposition any assistance, if you're out there and you're listening, Occupods, I would be very calm and civil during your convention because it will really not work out well for you if you decide to get all uppity and cause all sorts of problems and attack cops and, and you know, riot and do all that. I would pretty much show up wearing ties and have some nice discussions and, and take baths beforehand and stuff like that because I think if you have one massive Occupy movement at the Democratic Convention, the country's just going to say, screw this, these people are a bunch of weirdos. So yep. while I'd never want to help the opposition, that's my caution to you out there on the left. Be careful about how it's going to look to a lot of ordinary people who maybe only spend 3 or 4% of their time thinking about politics in the news because they're focused on, you know, earning a living and stuff like that. And, and that, that, even though everything else I just said was a knock to the Occupy movement, that really wasn't. You've got to look at how middle of the road people are going to look at you, people who are focused on their families and their schools and how you present yourself to them. So be very careful about strongly protesting at your convention because you might come out looking like a bunch of jackasses in the in the uh, grand scheme of things. So I would highly, uh, highly recommend you guys be careful with that. That being said, Michigan and Arizona are coming up shortly. We will absolutely have an episode debut right after the uh, results of Michigan and Arizona to talk about where we go from there. And see how far off we were. Exactly. And again, Maybe I, Ron Paul will win both states. There you go. That would be great. And I'm just going to go back and edit all of our previous shows to, to throw my <laughs> predictions in to say I won for everything. You know, So I'm not really worried about whether we were right or wrong, but we can talk about whether we were right or wrong. <laughs> um, you know, you're going to listen to episode one of Viewpoint after the election, and it's going to be me saying... Well, Ed, I think the yeah, I predicted all along that it would be President Obama winning. So there'll, there'll, there'll be some some you know sketchy editing going on there. But yeah, we'll have an episode coming out for you guys right after Arizona and Michigan, and then we're gonna have a, another episode on the night of Super Tuesday. Might be a late episode. Uh, might come out. It'll probably not be released until that Wednesday or Thursday. But we're gonna go over in detail again all the results of Super Tuesday, and where it goes from there. So, ladies and gentlemen, I urge you to stay tuned. And, of course, as always, you should visit us at www.basenettv.com. Basenettv.com. We're on YouTube. We're on Mevio. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on Google+. Plus. We're all over the place. You know where to find us. If yeah, you're, we'll if you're listening to this podcast, you already know where to find us. Oh, yeah, that's true. So, you know what? I'm going to stop telling people where to find us. <laughs> no, no, no. And and let's not let's not also forget to tell them that we do need their financial support, too. Yes. On that website that Tony just mentioned, BasinetTV.com, up on the top, there's a donations tab. Click on that donations tab, and it takes you to Google Checkout. And for as little as $1, you could become a supporter of this and all other Basinet TV shows. And you'll even get mentioned on this show as an executive producer, if you choose to, you could remain anonymous, but if you choose to, we'll even name you as an executive producer of the show for your donation and contribution, so please do so. Yeah, and you'll officially, will never receive, any donors will never receive a de-endorsement, uh, except <laughs> Michelle Bachman. Once you've been de-endorsed, that's it. So, well, thank you again, everyone, and we hope to, hope to hear from you again. Hope you come and listen to us again on our next episode of Viewpoint. So stay tuned. This is Tony Mizuko signing off. <laughs>